this video we'll look at the tesseract that is at the center of the Labyrinth of Limitations display. Um, I'm hoping to make it more clear why this is important. Uh, like any geometry, this tesseract shows connections in a way where you can see it all in one picture and it can begin to help you to see things um, more clearly and can actually help your playing to do that. It's definitely helped mine a lot. Well, we're going to start out with an excerpt from a, a Barry Harris video. This is a wonderful thing that Barry did at the with um, the Lincoln Center. It's a seven-part series, and I will link to this one in the uh, video description. Okay, and this is uh, episode. This is the fifth of this seven-part video series. It's all really wonderful. Let's see what he says. C to minus seven. Show me the dominant seven. How you going to do it? Just move the C to B. That's the dominant seven, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's wonderful. What we're going to see in this video, one of the things that I want to show you is that Barry is familiar with all the connections, um, deeply familiar with all the connections in this uh, shape. So here we are on C diminished seventh. I'm calling it E flat diminished seventh just because it makes, I like the way the tesseract lines up when I do that. And I move over along this line, and now I've done what Barry just had the student do, which is move one note down, and I'm on B dominant seventh. Now, um, let's keep going. Let's see what he says next. I'll go back to the C diminished seventh and let's see what happens. Back, raise it, minus six. Okay, so what do we do there? I went back and I'm going to go, I'm gonna press my up key and move up in the Tesseract and now I am, uh, sorry, I'm not on the up. And uh, so now here I am, this is where we are and I'm going to move up. And that's what he did. He moved to F sharp minor six, which is the six on the five is what we call that. So watch when I go down, now this E flat will move up here to the top of the Tesseract. So here it is. And then I move down and notice I'm moving in the exact same direction. In other words, if this line continued this way, if you can, yes, you can see my mouse, then, then, um, then there I am right there. So I get to follow that line and see that visual as I do this move. And that's a super important thing. So not only is this diminished connected to four different dominant sevenths, because as I lower any note, and he shows this elsewhere in the video, it becomes a dominant seventh. But also I can see the connections here as I move upwards. Let's see what he does next. So of course you might say half diminished. Yeah. See? Average young cat would say that. Okay, go back to the C to minus. Move two consecutive notes. Major sixes. So he moved upwards. So I'm on the diminished. So now I'm putting it down at the bottom of the next tesseract up. Just to explain that, see, I was here. This is E flat. Let's find it in this circle. There's E flat. Imagine each one of these circles is actually a shape like this, a tesseract. Because, and if I could zoom in, you could see each one. All right, so that's what we have here as I'm on E flat. The, this, uh, the, there is another tesseract with E flat at the bottom and then E at the top. So look here, and now I'm on E flat and E is at the top. And then the next tesseract up is with F at the top. You see? So here I am, and he moved upwards, I believe, to C major six. And there it is. So what he's saying is move two consecutive notes means move two notes that are a third apart. So here I am, or a tenth apart in this in this case. Notice this E flat's gonna move up and this F sharp is gonna move up to G and that is a tenth and there I am. So what we're gonna find is he is mapping out this shape. And this is profound to me because, um, well, in Tomoshko's uh, Geometry Music, he has a wonderful chapter where he's looking, it's called Chopin's Tesseract. And he is showing how Chopin, in the 19th century is composing pieces that show that he is completely aware of all of these relationships. He might not be able to sit down and draw the shape, but he is aware of how every vertex connects to another and he uses it consistently in his composition in the ooh passages. This brings me to something important is that um, uh, while diatonicism, diatonicism is really important, diatonic things are really common, I have focused in this channel primarily on chromaticism, which is a big feature of Barry's theories. In the episode zero, as I said that for me, a lot of the ooh moments that kind of sound so wrong, but so right, are chromatic moments. 
and chromaticism can be arrived at quite easily by just taking a note and moving it up and down. I mean, taking a chord and moving everything up and down. But something a little bit more difficult is to do this kind of thing, where notes move in different directions by small amounts to arrive at chromatic events. And that is, um, there's all kinds of wonderful moments in music that do that. So we just went up. Now what he's going to show us, let's see. Move him down, move him down. So, so look, he went down. So we, we went up from this diminished, this E-flat diminished. Now the E-flat is at the top, and I'm going to go down. And I moved the same set of notes. Notice that. I have E-flat and F-sharp again, and I'm moving down. And this is the 6 on the 5 relationship. So C major 6 is the 6 on the 5 to F major 6. And look look at this. So, so I go F major 6 goes to this diminished. I can start to see the connection here. See, these are pathways to get up to E flat. And that's pretty hard to see, but there's a square right here where this connects to this, to this, to this. And now look up at the geometry up here. Now I'm here. And now look at this square. So it's across a square, actually, that connects like diamonds connected together. It goes down this way. And isn't that neat? I think that's really cool. So now we have B7 going up to F sharp minor 6. And I'm going to stay at this concept for just a second here because what we have also, we know that we have the tritone. And that's across here. So we start to see a shape that is a square-like shape here. I'll come back to that in a second. Maybe we should continue with this video. So we just did the F major 6 to C major 6, 6 on the 5 relationship. Up or down is major 6s. Okay. Now, then you, put, then you say, oh, well, that's consecutive. What, about the, what happens with the non-consecutive notes? And I'll say, try it. Mm -hmm. Move to C and F sharp down. Down to seven flat five. All right. So here it, I am on uh, on my diminished chord. I'm going to move C and F sharp down, and I know the pathway gets me to here. See this this shape and this shape. These are both dominant seven flat fives. But I'm going to this one that connects to my F seven and my B seven which is my dominant seventh and my tritone. That's why I kind of wanted to show you that. So I complete it. And look, I went down with two non-consecutive notes. They are a fifth apart or a diminished fifth apart within this. I move them both down and I get a dominant seventh flat five. Now, if I move those two notes up, let's see what Barry says. Even if you move them up, go back, move them up. E flat seven with flat five. Now look at that. That so I went down. Now I'm going to move these same two notes. You can watch them in the fretboard and the sheet music. I go up, and notice I have this square that looks like this is the square from here to here to here to here. Now I'm going to go up the tesseract. Now I'm here, and now I have a square from the the um, six on the five, and I'm going to go up. And there it is. There's that diamond relationship again. And then what's over here is the tritones minor. So let's, oh, sorry, that's the, uh, that's the six and the five. Here is the tritones minor. So I'll show you what I mean in just a second. So let's go down. So he's showing us dominant seven flat five. And I go dominant seventh. And I go diminished. And then I go up to the minor six on the five. And then I go up. And notice where I am in the test rack. I'm on the right side of these two dominant seven flat fives. But down here, I was on the left side. OK? And now, then to just to wrap this part of the discussion up, I have my dominant seven proper. I have my tritones minor. Or it could be vice versa. But in the app, whenever you play a five chord, it will always be the dominant seventh is in this location in the Tesseract. And you can right across see immediately where the tritone is. And then you can notice I go up along this pathway. And then I go up and continue in that same direction from here to here. And there is my tritones minor. Now I'm going to do something, but before I do, I just want to restate, Barry has now covered all of the information in this Tesseract. He covered, because elsewhere in this video, he has talked about how you can move any note down. So these are all what's called family 
That's family relationship, so I'm moving around. And these two are less related than these two for certain reasons. These two share the same dominant 7 flat 5 whole tone collection, whereas these two are connected to this one. That would be their dominant 7 flat 5. When I have these two as the main dominance, they'll be in this relationship. You'll always see when I do a 5 chord. So Barry's talked about these. He's talked about the major 6s in their family. The minor 6s he views as above the diminished. I kind of think of it that way too. I think of the actual shape I'm thinking of as going from here up to here. So it's the center of one tesseract to a center of another. Let's enter in a chord. I'm just going to do a dominant seventh chord. All right, so this is, this is my um, uh, dominant seventh, and here I am on B7, right in that relationship that we were looking at. Now I have some controls on my keyboard, the plus and minus keys and the zero key that allow me to move through what I call the scale of scales, which is doing what we just did, which works on dominant sevenths. So if I hit minus, I end up on the dominant seven flat five. Now it's being labeled for me. Now watch when I go up. It's now, because it was just on the dominant seventh, now it's on the tritone. So I can outline this square it's a little disorienting, I admit, because the tesseract moves so that when we go up here, it never we never see that. It, go, it puts it down here in the next tesseract up, where E flat is here. But if I just do the automated controls, you can see I'll just do this part so it's less disorienting. You can see the dominant seventh, and you see the tritone, tritone substitution. And whenever I'm on the dominant seventh, it's going to go up to the diminished, which is now going to be at the bottom of the next tesseract. And now it goes up to the six on the five, continuing in that motion. And then it goes up one more to, this is where you move those two consecutive notes um, upwards and you get the dominant seven. Well, I mean, this is the uh, dominant nine with a sharp five, which is just the other half of a whole tone. Let's look at that relationship real quick. Cause I think this stuff is, you know, is possible to see in this way. So we have, oh, I did this wrong. So, okay. So, and I'm gonna move down in the neck. Okay, so that's nice. So here I am, and then I go up, and those are the two notes. If you see the these two notes here, they're gonna go down. If I just go to, the, I'll go to the diminished like that just to make it clearer. But if we just look here, I'm going to skip over the diminished now, and I'm going to go up like that. I did that wrong. Um, there we go, sorry. So here we are, four notes. And then I put them together with these four notes, and I have the octatonic because they share two notes, but they have two notes individual to each one of them, and that gives us the octatonic collection. I put that together with this, and I got other stuff we need to talk about, but that's for another episode. But now you can see this is the scale of scales as I go down, right? So that's the tritone, down to the dominant seventh, up to the dominant up to the diminished, which is now the bottom of the next tesseract up. Remember the tesseracts are arranged in this order in a chain connected at these top and bottom corners. And I go, and then I go up. And now I'm at the top. So if I go up anymore, it's stuck. And then I go down. And now I'm on the tritones minor to the diminished. Now I'm gonna go down to the uh, tritone substitution, back down to the dominant seventh. So you can look at that and you can really start to observe and you can do these with different voicings, of course, and you can do these in different parts of the neck and you can do these with arpeggiating. You see, and you could go. All of these things are possible or moving through the scales of chords, which is really wonderful. Now, um, to wrap up then, Barry says, A diminished scale is the diminished and then the four tonics, the dominants that come from the diminished form a diminished, mm -hmm. and you put them together. Now, that's just wonderful, I think, because now we have um, uh, what we're looking at is, okay, so I'm at the, uh, I'll move to the bottom. Okay, so here we are. So the diminished chord, an octatonic scale or a diminished scale is what Barry calls it, which is a great way to refer to it. Um, when you say half whole or whole half, it's not as kind of revealing to information, I think. Uh, you know, I think diminished scale is a great way to say it. I say octatonic, um, it fits in with uh, um, what I've thought for a long time, and, uh, and I think it's not contradictory or uh, I, I think it works. 
So um, here we go. I am uh, looking at this dominant seventh and I look at how I move any note down from it and it becomes a dominant seventh chord. And I put those four roots together and I end up with this because this is a combination of the notes F, A flat, D, and B, which you can see right here. And I put that together with this. And now that is my diminished. You see that? That's what we're looking at. That's our, that's our diminished scale or our octatonic scale, right? So these are our connections. And you can see uh, there's a lot more to talk about, but I think this is the first thing that I think is important to see about the Tesseract is that it's in a chain, that it lets us see some really important connections. Consider again the diamond shape. If you can you know, start to look at this and try to see this is, a, this is a square. And when I put two squares together at the corners, they make a diamond type, like a chain of diamonds kind of. And look here, now I'm on the six and the five and then it connects here. But this I view as being deeper into the page and this is out. Kind of that's how I see the 3D-ness of this. That's how it's arranged. So you can really see these things and I hope it's been helpful and uh, inspire some of you to check things out more. Um, everybody, I really appreciate everybody who's gotten the app. I appreciate everybody who hasn't and supports the channel and follows things. And I will always make an effort to make plenty of opportunities to learn concepts in a free way if you want. And um, uh, But with the app, you can do everything we just did in this video, but at any area of the neck with any voicing and explore as you want to, which can be really valuable as you follow along. Thank you so much for your time, and there is more to come. Uh, keep practicing.